two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, April 13th, 2023. In accordance with the board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fass, please call the roll of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Dr. Savoy. Present. Ms. Harvey. Present. Ms. Lichter. Thank you. Ms. Faz, please call the role of staff members on the committee participating in today's meeting. Dr. Yarborough. And Mr. Handy. Present. Thank you. Ms. Faz, please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in the meeting. Ms. Joseph. Present. Mr. Holmes. Present. Thank you. Are there any other members participating on the call that you have not named? I guess not. OK. All righty, we're ready to begin the meeting. New business, Baltimore City Public Schools graduation rate student group trends. The introduction will be by Mr. Douglas Handy. And a presentation by Ms. Joseph and Mr. Well, he's not going to be present. I can't pronounce his name, but he won't be here. OK. OK, all righty. We're ready to begin. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Savoy. Um, so as you said, we do have our graduation uh, rates uh, for this afternoon. We have an overview of um, the work being done around our graduation rates. So we're going to look at trends by student group and hear about work being done um, really to uh, increase graduation rates and any uh, issues that we are seeing within those graduation rates, you'll hear about some work being done to address that as well. So um, at this time, I'll turn it over to our presenter uh, for this topic, and that is uh, Ms. Joseph. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kiria Joseph, and I'm one half of the executive directors. I'm in charge of high schools. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of the uh, rate trends by student group. Uh, next slide, please. And so this first slide, uh, we wanted to prepare for you um, trend data um, of the adjusted cohorts. And so the cohorts just mean um, for the year 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade years. And in the, uh, if you could go back to that slide, please. At the top, um, it's broken down into student groups uh, by race. Um, and this is just the enrollment um, because we wanted you to see um, where our enrollment trends were um, by race. And then the lower um, table is our other student group with our special services. I um, mean, we wanted to kind of tease some of that out so you can also see um, our students who receive special services would be our English learners, um, our students who receive free and reduced meals, and our special education students. And one of the things that you will notice a uh, trend is that our enrollment has increased um, in the population of students who are receiving those special uh, services, but also um, you will see a trend of enrollment increasing um, for our minority students. And some of our largest increases are coming from our Hispanic Latinx um, community, most notably, um, but also our races that are two or more um, has had an increase and our Black or African-American students as well. And our Asian students. Next slide, please. So this particular data point talks about the four-year adjusted cohort and our graduation rates. 
Um, we looked at trends or we're presenting to you the trends from 2019 to 2022 um, as color-coded color -coded in the bar graphs. This particular slide breaks that down um, by race um, for those, for those uh, groups. And then you will see that um, consistently uh, across our student groups, uh, we have experienced um, some decreases with the exception of our native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. But if you go back to the enrollment, you'll notice that that enrollment um, is smaller and not as significant. If you look at the first set of the bar graphs throughout all, it doesn't look as much as of a decrease from 2019 to 2022, but as you move throughout the area that we are focusing on and we continue to focus on our Hispanic Latinx uh, students that are there, you will notice a decrease also for our black um, students, uh, but our biggest drop has been in our Hispanic Latinx students. Next slide, please. We, again, we wanted to also pull this out for those who are receiving special ed services. And you'll notice the same trend that now when we drill through a little further for our Hispanic Latinx students, a lot of those who are receiving English language uh, services, they already started off as a gap when we look at students who are even receiving special ed and free and reduced meals, they already started out lower. And then the trend has been that they had a decrease. But when you also look at our students who are receiving free and reduced meals, they have a large, a large gap or, or decrease um, as, as well. Next slide, please. So our dropout rates, and this is a, another way to look at um, the data there. Um, again, it, you'll notice the exact same trend. And so when you look at dropout rates, you actually want the numbers to be to decrease. However, you will see that it is increasing um, and our lar some of our largest increases are coming from our Hispanic Latinx Latino students. Um, that's our largest increase for dropout rates from 2019 to 2022. Okay, next slide. And then again, we wanted to pull out the dropout rate looking at our special ed services. You'll notice the same trend. Our largest dropout rate that begins to increase over time are coming from students who are receiving English language learner services, and they have always been a student group that had a larger dropout rate when compared to other students who are receiving services in our district. Next slide. And so this is where I want to really focus on. So what, do, what are schools doing? And so for the purpose of this meeting, uh, when I use the word graduation committee, um, please note that that means that that committee consists of administrators, its counselors, its department chairs, it's the pupil personnel workers, and we call them PPW workers. It is members from uh, the Department of Research uh, and, and Accountability and the executive director, Sam and I, um, are part of the graduation rate meetings. These meetings are held biweekly but for some schools, they hold them weekly. And what we have worked on as a system so that um, either a member from DRAA, and that would either be Tag Landon or Dr. Staley or myself or Sam could attend. Some of the meetings are by teams. Some of, the, some of them are in person. Some of them are bi-weekly and weekly so that one of the four of us um, can be in attendance for each of those meetings. During those meetings, they are monitoring grades, they're monitoring attendance, testing and supports. Uh, we use several doc several data points uh, from Power and Form, but we are going student by student in every school um, for the gra graduation committee. 
Um, we look at individualized supports for those committees, and that's where those action plans come from that meeting. And so if it is something that is dealing with attendance and a student hasn't been there and it's a chronic attendance issue, the PPW is sitting at the table there and they can literally either leave the meeting and begin to go check on the student or within the next coming days begin to um, work on that work. And so that's why we wanted to highlight that it's an individualized support by student. Um, the purpose of having someone from DRAA there is to assist the school teams with data reports. We have a new data reporting system, so we wanted to make sure um, that number one, our schools knew how to use them effectively. Um, we get live feedback from the schools on how we can strengthen the tools and then tag and Dr. Staley will go back to their team to make enhancements so that we can make the data reporting process easier and more manageable for our schools so that they can act. So it's an, a process about action. Um, the professional learning opportunities, any schools that are highlighting best practices, uh, we showcase them. We bring these all uh, principals together. Um, we brought them together twice for our project graduation meeting system wide, and we highlight different schools who are using practices um, that are making a difference uh, to improve graduation rate. We've allowed assistant principals uh, to do the, the professional uh, learning um, so that we have a collaborative uh, environment. Um, as we are showcasing those. Another area that uh, Sam and I also do is the extended day program. That is a term like night school. So we actually go um, in the evening to all of the sites. Uh, we're making our way around and we uh, go with uh, Dr. Elmendorf, who is over that program and his staff to support credit recovery. Um, we use that as an opportunity to talk to students directly. What is working? What isn't working? Um, we use that as an opportunity for motivation for students who are there with credit recovery to look at some of the practices to make sure that um, that program is yielding the benefit because that they are servicing um, our students who are critically in need for the credit recovery, which is directly impacting graduation rate. And then the last part is we have a monthly graduation analysis report. The information from that report comes directly from Power Inform. They literally copy and paste it there. Um, can you all still hear me? Yes. I can, yeah, can. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, they copy and paste that report there. And so um, it is sent to us in there. We're asking them what, what has been working, what isn't working, what is your graduation rate at this point in the year? Uh, what additional supports do you need? And by additional supports, uh, we have been transitioning to Saturday school supports. That's one way um, where students come in who may need additional tutoring. Um, Dr. Elmendorf's office has offered additional um, funding and support for students who may be in those credit recovery through APEX to also come in for additional op, um, office at, off hours. And so that's a way that we use that graduation analysis report and it's sent to us every month. And myself, uh, Sam and Tag and Dr. Staley, we're looking at that data to actually see what is working so that schools who are trending for an improvement, we can um, model those best practices system-wide. Next slide, please. Here are areas um, that we are beginning to work on that we still need additional support throughout several of the previous slides. You heard me talk about our English language learners um, and different things that we're looking at. So the very first thing that we notice is our service learning hours. Um, and BCPS students need the 75 to graduate. You can earn it naturally uh, once you pass classes through projects. Once we did an audit on that, we found that that information wasn't being documented accurately throughout the system, system wide. So we were able to work with a uh, GEMS team, DRAA, and the executive directors to really interrogate that a lot, uh, 
a, a more and then we were able to build in a formula so that that will go through and be awarded to students naturally. And we wanted to make sure that that happened by middle school so that it wasn't just on the high school so that that energy can be used for uh, looking at grade monitoring. And so that led to a number of students being able to meet the service learning hour criteria. Um, and so that also then led to staff having additional time to work on some other monitoring and supports for students. Uh, when we talked to students directly, the student feedback was that while APEX is a great program, it shouldn't be the only way we do credit recovery. They wanted us to move to the traditional credit recovery in our evening program schools. And so we were able to um, use the data from the students, look at courses that they were not passing, which was the Algebra 1, English 10. And then those are the courses that we piloted to have some face-to-face. -face. When Sam and I go around with Doug Elmendorf, those are the classes and students that we're talking to about this program. And right now um, we are trending to at least 95% of the students are on track to pass those courses. And that rate is much higher than what they were doing because the APEX is self-monitored. It's a completely online and self-paced. And that works for some students, but we were noticing that some of our students, especially those who receive special education services, um, it, it just was not yielding the benefit. And so we wanted to get out of this model where we say, oh, we are, we're not going to use this anymore. We want to get in the model of the and. What the kids were telling us is that's fine for some kids in some classes, but in our case, they wanted the traditional credit recovery. And so we were able to bring this proposal um, actually to Dr. Yarbrough and, and really begin to show the data. And she was able um, to to use um, and, and kind of maneuver some of our funding to fund the um, credit recovery. So we're, we're very thankful for that. As we were talking with students, um, I we, you see the word using reimagining and in the blueprint um, for Maryland, it really talks about reimagining school time or high school time. And so that is exactly what students are telling us. Uh, as we look at our dropout rate, for our English language learner students. Um, they have expressed to us um, the desire to rethink when school is offered. Um, can we be creative in offering school and classes in the evening? Some of them have um, stated that they want to work during the day for multiple reasons um, and that they would continue with school if it were offered in the evening. And so we are constantly advocating for this idea of reimagining and how we look at this traditional model, our students are telling us to think outside of the box more um, so that they are motivated to stay on track to graduate. But this idea of school has to be uh, from eight to two, only in a brick and mortar is a concept that our students are challenging us to, to think differently. And so um, one of the things I, I would like to just leave for the board my last few minutes um, before I can take questions is as you're going around and, and as you're looking at um, different projects and different things to fund, um, consider reviewing the, just this reimagining school time, thinking uh, through the lens of our English language learners. Uh, right now, they are the student group that is having the highest dropout rate. Um, what would alternative education models look like? Um, how do we service students who made very poor decisions, even legally, and who may be um, and, uh, crim criminally, but we are still old, they're still owed an education, but they have to be educated in a way that keeps them safe, that keeps the students and the staff safe. So what does an alternative school model look like? Um, for now. And so that is um, one of the things that we are constantly just thinking outside of the box, uh, outside of the box, and again, reimagining again this school time with the with the idea that it is all around support for our students, but a traditional model is not meeting the needs of all students. I think that is my last slide. 
and I will take uh, questions. And I'm sorry, uh, the my screen, it looks frozen on mine. So I'm going to just um, maybe turn off my camera there. And I hope that everyone can still hear me and I can take questions for you. Hello? Questions, anyone? Um, Dr. Savoy, I have a question. It's Ms. Lichter. Okay. Oh. Chair recognizes oh, Ms. Lichter. Ms. Joseph, when they when the um, students talk about the reimagining, do they give do they give you any ideas or any suggestions, or is it just kind of rethinking through the the time? No, schedule? they give us the ideas. So the first idea that they gave us was to have the traditional uh, credit recovery courses, meaning with the teacher and reteaching the con content, not through Apex. So we did that. Okay. Um, we brought that to Dr. Yarbrough as well, um, and they were and and they approved it. And so we were able to do that. Hired additional staff in the EDLP, got the students enrolled, and those are the students who we're constantly talking to. Um, my, our next visit with them is in May. Um, to see their progress and where they are. They're engaged, it's intimate. Um, they, they feel hopeful and we have asked them what would they change? The only other thing, again, they gave us a suggestion to move these um, EDLP time up. It was very late, it was five to nine and they were explaining like, I have to do this and then I travel back home. I'm not getting home until 10. So we did that. <laughs> um, okay. We made the change. The last thing is the, that they're asking us to do is, and this is um, a little more specific for our English language learners, but we are continue. We've met with um, a total of almost 280 students, but this particular um, suggestion is from some of our English language learner students, and I'm sure that other students would also um, take advantage. But they want us to consider what would it looked like if school were at a different time in the day so that they could work during the day. Um, they have some very extenuating circumstances sometimes when they come to the country and they have to be a provider for their family. And, and some of the better uh, paid jobs are during the day. And if they if school was in the afternoon, they said that they would continue if they had that option. And so that is one specific um, suggestion that they have requested. So a full six and a half hour day, but starting at three, like, or are they saying compact the time? You can kind of compact the time um, okay. so that it's there so that they could, again, work during the day and have something in the evening, kind of like a twilight. Okay, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Anybody else have a question? I'd like to ask something. What schools offer that program, the evening program, extended day? So the extended day, they're at sites. Um, and so the sites that they're at, they're at Woodlawn High, Milford Mill, um, Parkville, and Dundalk. OK. Thank you. So we, we it's spread uh, throughout the county. And then there is a, a Saturday um, component as well. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Mr. Handy. Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Um, Ms. Joseph, again, thank you for your presentation. Um, Dr. Savoy and committee members, if it's okay with you all, I would uh, excuse uh, Ms. Joseph at this time and then continue with uh, the next part of our agenda. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to share. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Bye -bye. Okay. One second, please. Our next presentation will be from Mr. Douglas Handy, Applying an Equity Lens in Decision Making. Mr. Handy. 
Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Uh, pardon me, I was having trouble unmuting. All right, so uh, as Dr. Savoy stated, we're going to look at our uh, equity lens and start to build some uh, capacity, I'm, I'm hoping, within the committee to apply the equity lens um, through the course of your, your proceedings. And I'm, as I get into this presentation, I'm thinking back to our last meeting. I um, really appreciated at the, uh, the discussion that occurred and the comments that were made around, you know, really equity being a part of all operations within BCPS, including, you know, those of the Board of Education. So uh, to help us with this, um, I've pulled a scholarly article and I have excerpts from the article in our presentation. And what I'd like us to do is take a look at these equity questions um, from the Maryland Association of Boards of Education and see how we can apply those as we review the article. So I will facilitate us um, through this process. Um, I do wanna mention before I get into the activity, um, I'm hoping that as the board moves forward, uh, you all will consider uh, equity training for yourselves as, as board members. So currently um, my team and I, uh, we do facilitate equity training uh, for staff members in BCPS. And you know we started with our uh, superintendent's cabinet, uh, executive directors, some other central office leaders, principals and assistant principals. Um, and we're looking to provide resources and training to as many of our staff members as possible. Um, we're currently working with our Teacher Equity Academy, which is a group of teachers who help us facilitate professional development, and they're working with our school-based equity liaisons. So as we look at trying to build our capacity um, within BCPS, again, I would uh, ask that you consider what MABE offers um, as far as resources. Um, I believe they do offer some professional development. Um, I do. I know if you go to their website, they have uh, like a, a resource uh, for guidance along the lines of equity in regards to the work of boards of education. So um, this is a resource with these equity, quest equity lens questions that you know we've been trying to really uh, encourage uh, staff within BCPS to use and um, really hoping that you all can take advantage of resources off, um, offered by me beyond these questions. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, for this particular activity, and I, I did facilitate this uh, last school year for the, uh, at that time, who was the, the members of the Board Equity Committee. And as um, our new members are joining, um, I thought it would be a good opportunity to revisit the presentation. So uh, this article is a scholarly article, and I'm just going to read from the abstract just to give the context before we get into the activity. Um, so the case illustrates why school leaders must be culturally proficient to serve all students and lead effectively. Um, the case uh, discussed is, is in Ohio and is representative of many other American schools. Um, in particular, the author examines the cultural challenges educational leaders must commonly face. Uh, the case encourages administrators to participate in meaningful conversations with stakeholders to solve complex issues. And the hope is to better understand how school leaders in diverse contexts can lead and embrace different cultures, beliefs, and norms. Uh, the author also poses questions designed to prepare educational leaders for similar situations where they must address issues of culture. So even though the author has uh, framed their work really with uh, school leaders in mind, I think as we go through, you'll see how there, are, again, it's the situation is applicable to um, a board member, a school leader, a central office leader, um, multiple stakeholders within um, an educational setting. Um, so the, the first part of this article is going to talk about uh, the background information um, on the situation. Again, the school is located in Dayton, Ohio. Um, I want to provide uh, committee members also with uh, the equity lens questions. They were on our previous slide, uh, but I will put a link in the chat uh, so you can refer to those um, as we go through this activity as well. All right, so I just put a link in the chat for you. All right, so for the first part, we're going to look at the background of Dayton, Ohio. Um, as a city. So before we even get into uh, the school system, the school district itself. So there's three slides that give us this background. So between uh, the years 2000 and 2010, the general population of Dayton decreased by nearly 15 percent. 
yet the foreign-born population increased by more than 50 percent, making Dayton with the largest percentage increase in its foreign-born population arriving since 2000. So with this basic description of Dayton, Ohio, if we look at our five equity lens questions, what question could we uh, use to frame how we look at this piece of data uh, regarding uh, the uh, general population of Dayton as it now stands? And if we can go back um, to the five questions, just want to put those back up on the previous slide. All right, so these are our five questions. Again, hopefully you're able to access those um, from the link that I provided. So at this time, I'm going to invite our committee members. So looking at those five questions and then looking at the first question posed, which of those five questions or the first statement that was posed, which of those five questions uh, would you apply uh, to your analysis of that first point? Can you share the first point again? Yes. Um, thank you. So thank you. That, okay. So would it be the third one? The third question? OK, so Ms. Lick is saying the third question. All right, so have you intentionally involved stakeholders who are also members of the communities affected by this policy? Program practice decision or action. Can you validate your assessments um, if you're using the one or you know questions one or two? Um, but again, you're you're including um, involving stakeholders who are affected by what we see as this change. Okay, so thank you, Ms. Lichter. Um, any other uh, questions that come to mind for any committee members? I think question four. Okay, question four. So, what are the barriers to more equitable outcomes? Um, for example, they could be mandated, political, emotional, financial, programmatic, or managerial. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. And any other questions that come to mind? Okay. I, mean, I guess they, they, they all oh, could no. in a way. It depends on what. I guess it's just the awareness of the change in population. But I mean, it could also be this second one, depending on if we're looking at a policy program or practice. OK, so Ms. Lichter, if I follow what you're saying, so we see this action or this this is this dynamic is taking place with this change of population. And if we're looking at uh, question one, uh, or sorry, question two, as you mentioned, are there any unintended consequences that arise as a result of this change in population? Right. Yeah. OK. OK, thank you. All right, so let's take a look. Um, so what I've done, I've gone through and I've done my analysis and this has given me a chance to uh, interact with you all to see where you all, you know, see if there's, this, you know, thinking lines up. So Ms. Lecter thought, you know, depending on how you look at this, you could involve all five. Uh, we also heard uh, question four and question three specifically. So um, could we advance the, uh, yep, so question one uh, is one that I brought up too. So if we look at uh, the increase and uh, you know, we still have an underrepresented population potentially, and then we're looking at the impact on that group. And I, I see that as similar um, to, to number three in a lot of ways. If we can advance one more. Uh, question two, which you just discussed. So I also thought question two was applicable. And I think we have one more that I had identified. So can we advance one more? All right, and then I did put in question three, which is our first one. So um, again, I think, you know, I look at these as where would I start, like a starting point based on just the information I've been given. And I think we can continue to peel back layers and maybe get into even more um, of the questions. But I think these questions give us an entry point, um, one or more of these questions for each of these circumstances. All right, let's move on to the next slide, please. All right, so next we have, uh, along with the background, since redlining occurred, the Miami River has historically served as a natural separation between races, economic status levels, and access to opportunities. So looking at this statement, which questions come to mind for you all?
I would say question four. <laughs> okay, okay. Question four. So again, looking at um, the barrier to more equitable outcomes. So we know we have um, some disparities in economic status levels. Um, and again, that's spelled out. Uh, let me see. Yep, financial is actually one of the examples they give. So yep, thank you, Ms. Hart. Right. Any others that come to mind? All right, so why don't we advance and see what, uh, so question one is, is one I brought up as well. So looking at the different, um, we talk about separation of races. If we're looking at groups on one side of the river versus the other. So I looked at those groups um, and how they're affected. And then if we can advance again. And then question three, again, involving the stakeholders was one that came up for me. And I think I had one more on this as well we can advance again. And then question four, as Ms. Harvey mentioned. So again, looking at um, any barriers that arise. Okay, all right, next slide, please. All right, so uh, last piece of information on the background before we get to the school district itself. Less real estate mortgages are given to the residents located on the west side of the river. And what's coming up for me on this uh, is our uh, boundary uh, study and when we look at uh, redrawing boundaries with schools, because we often hear about references to families, students that live in apartments versus those that are homeowners. So just this one sentence in itself to me carries a lot of weight, um, something I think um, we need to give consideration to. Uh, so what's coming up for you um, in regards to the questions as you look at this statement? I mean, to be honest, I guess I'm having trouble with the statements that are on the screen and then aligning them to the questions. I, OK, because I, I guess we're not trying to. The statements are just giving us more information about the district. They're not telling us what we're working on to then know what questions we should be keeping in mind. Maybe I'm just missing something. OK. Do any of the other uh, committee members want to comment on what Ms. Lichter shared uh, before I respond? All right, so Ms. Lichter, the way I'm looking at it, um, and I'll just give you so a little background. When I was looking at a way to try to introduce the equity lens questions, I didn't want to use uh, data that was really BCPS's data. I wanted us to be able to step out and look at like another uh, data set, another set of circumstances. And I had come across this article and doing some other reading. And as I went through, I felt like there were situations in the article that were described that if we do not apply an equity lens to how we're looking at situations, uh, we might be able, we might be missing an opportunity to actually apply some equitable action. So I guess when I look at this statement, and I do want to see maybe as we get to the school system, the, the statements will connect um, stronger. But I, I feel like, um, and let's advance the slides. I'll try to illustrate my point by how I analyze this. So I put in question one. Um, so if we know that there are, uh, we have students coming from the west side of the river and that there are less real estate mortgages. Um, what is what is the, so I'm, I'm gonna identify those students as potentially affected, and then I wanna start to look at the potential impacts. So, you know, there could be an economic impact based on home ownership versus um, renting. Um, there could be some other aspects of the living situation that I need to dig into to get more information on. So to me, I guess the situation or the circumstance including this statement is prompting me to to ask more questions or to dig in a little bit more to make sure I'm not missing an opportunity um, again to try to take more equitable action and then um, there's a couple other questions that I identify for this one I believe so question two um, again you know if we look at uh, unintended consequences or potential disparities uh, with those that um, were not granted mortgages and those that were 
you know, are there services that need to be uh, provided to our, our students who are from the west side of the river? Are, there, are, are we doing our programming, not keeping in mind um, students on both sides of the river, things of that nature? And I think I might have had one more for this one. Okay, Brian, I did put in question three. So again, um, for me, question three is, is a go-to because it's the aspect of involving um, stakeholders um, who are affected in the community. And I know that's something, you know, that the board does actively in trying to um, hear from as many stakeholders as possible so that, you know, you can get those multiple perspectives. Uh, so that's, that's how I approached it um, when I brought this article in. Um, I do want to see, again, as we get into maybe the school level data, if the connections are stronger. But uh, any thoughts on what I've shared, uh, Ms. Lecter, based on your question? No, it kind of just confirms what I was thinking. OK, you said what you were thinking? I mean, the multiple, I mean, uh, most of the questions can lend itself just to, it still depends on the situation that's trying to be. Right, okay, this. right, but right. your statement that, right, that you could probably apply all five to many of the circumstances. Correct. Gotcha, okay, all right. Okay, let's look at a few on the school, um, as far as the school data, and then um, I can pause and just see if we have any, any general discussion. So let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna look at the school district. Um, it says, Welcome Dayton is an initiative led by the city to welcome and assist immigrants and refugees. The goal of this program is to reduce barriers to business development, increase participation in government, easing access to social services, and reducing the risk of employers uh, taking advantage of new immigrants. So um, let me pause to see if anybody wants to state any questions that come to mind for them. Um, I agree we could probably bring in all five. I am curious to see if there are any questions in particular though uh, that might come you know immediately to mind when you when you read this statement. All right, let's advance and we'll see the ones that I identify for this one. So question five came up for me um, about, you know, mitigating negative impacts and addressing the barriers. Uh, next one, please. All right, so I think that was it for that one. Um, so again, the way I looked at it is ones that came to mind immediately. So um, what I've done is, again, I pulled out certain passages um, to give us a chance to just go through and, and see what comes up. Uh, so I won't go through each slide because I think we've gotten a flavor for where I was going. Um, I understand uh, what Ms. Lichter's uh, concerns were, I guess, around, I guess, the way I'm trying to bring this in. But what's your sense on, I guess, these questions as a resource? Um, I'm also looking to see what my team and I can provide as far as uh, resources to you all as a committee, uh, to the general board, and I guess ensuring that uh, you have tools, if you will, as far as um, thinking and, and taking uh, action with, you know, with an equity lens at the forefront, which is really what our uh, Policy Zero 100 uh, requires all of us to do um, as members of, of, of BCPS. So uh, just any thoughts in general on these questions or any other resources? Uh, this is uh, Robin Harvey. I I, I do find the questions to be useful. Uh, it would be more helpful to me to apply them to BCPS when we're going through uh, these exercises. I think we're all clear that there's some equity issues within our system and confronting that truth is how we begin to do this very important work. And as Chair Lichter said, 
infuse equity across uh, everything we do. And as you also said, uh, so I am looking to see how we how we are applying these questions currently, uh, very specifically in uh, various areas of our um, school system and um, how we use our resources in terms of equity tools in that application. So that mm -hmm. that is what I would find uh, helpful. There's lots of places Lots of questions I have around, are we applying an equity lens or using an equity tool to determine, for instance, how we assign assistant principals, how mm -hmm. we do boundary studies, um, how we assign professional development, all of those, and those are just a few things. Uh, so I would, it would be helpful for me to uh, do a deeper dive into those types of conversations and also how the equity council weaves into all of this process. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. I appreciate what you shared. So um, one thing I can do, one action I can take based on what you've stated is working with uh, my fellow staff members. So when they prepare presentations to bring to you all as board members, that it, it is explicit in there that they've applied an equity lens and that it is framed within, you know, equity being centered in, you know, in the data that's presented and the decisions that are made. You talked about, you know, appointments of assistant principals, principals, things of that nature. So that's that's a, uh, an action item I will take to fellow staff members and, you know, continue to work with them to make sure that they can do that. Because as you pointed out, um, there are a lot of difficult conversations that we need to have, and I want to make sure we are leaning into those conversations and not avoiding the conversations that, you know, I believe we need to have if it's going to, you know, we're going to have um, change um, as a result of our action. So um, I will take that as an action item, um, again, to, like I said, work with staff to make sure, you know, it's evident to you all when you, when you, when you uh, see presentations that, that there has been, equity has been centered in, and, and the thoughts and actions. And, and uh, Mr. Handy, very specifically, like what, how, how equity was centered. I'm really interested okay. because we have to build our muscle in using these tools and doing these assessments. So mm -hmm. knowing that equity was centered in the decision-making process and even the planning and implementation process is good, but better for me is knowing how. Like okay. what specifically we did as a system to say, yes, this passes uh, or yes, this meets an equity standard. OK, I understand. Thank you. Any any other uh, comments or input from committee members? When you uh, when you started the um, presentation, you talked about training for the board. Mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned Mabe. Um, yes. Would you also be able to do training for the board if we decided that was the direction we wanted to go? Uh, so, Ms. Lichter, I will investigate that with uh, <laughs> Dr. Yarbrough. Uh, well, I think there's there's well as board chair, I think um, there's the request. You know, coming from you. Well, right. I can um, make the request, but then if the request was granted, would you? Um, I mean, I think the board does need some training, especially, but it may need to be chunked and pieces okay, like yeah. you know ongoing, not just like a one and done piece. But um, we're planning on having a retreat now that we have almost a full board. So starting the conversation, but then having it ongoing where we keep coming back and even looking at decisions that are made that we've made or are making through a lot of those questions but um so if i made the request and the press was i mean do you see that something that your office could could do or you'd rather us go through mabe um so i, I would be interested i think so the short answer is yes i think it's something okay. that um, our, our office can do 
Um, and again, I would just want to, you know, check in with uh, my right. leadership. Uh, no, of course. Yep. Right. We go but through yeah, all as far the. the yes. Yeah. And I think, Ms. Lichter, the way I'm looking at it is, is priorities, right? I, I can't think of a higher priority. So, you know, of course, we have the work we're doing now. And if that request were to come in and move forward, then, you know, to me, the priorities would, would shift accordingly. And that, you know, that to me, that would be the priority to provide that, okay. that support, yes, to you and, and the rest of the board. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, so um, if there are no other questions or comments from the committee, uh, Dr. Savoy, that really, um, again, there are multiple slides, but it's, it's just more the same, just the exercise itself. And, uh, you know, like I said, the article will be there. If there's anything you want to refer to, uh, I know, as, you know, Ms. Harvey said, end of the day, it is how we apply it in our actual work. Um, so that's why I want to make sure that right. we're all prepared to do that. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. All right. Move on to the next presentation. One second, please. Okay, the last item on the agenda. I don't know if my can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next equity committee meeting will be held on Thursday. May 11, 2023 at 4 p.m. The next equity committee meeting with equity council will be held on Thursday, May 25th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. Is there any other business? Um, would it be appropriate, um, Dr. Savoy, to talk about the equity council for a minute? Um, with me, it's fine, Mr. Handy. Uh, yes, absolutely. Mr. Haney, can you explain the Equity Council and the purpose? When they presented last time, they presented a plan. I wasn't understanding where, how that, who implements that plan and how does that fit? So could you just give us a little history on that, how the council got formed and the purpose? Sure, sure. So um, the, the purpose of the council uh, was to give the Equity Committee uh, multiple perspectives in terms of you know a, a range of stakeholders so we know it's you know it's not gonna be representative of course of every stakeholder we serve so many there's such diversity in the system but if you look at like the the membership it was you know and i don't want to leave out any any roles but it was essentially internal and external stakeholders uh, brought together to uh, give a perspective uh, to the equity committee now what you saw at the last meeting was was a work that that council did really this school year. So this is really the second school year they've been in operation. The first year you could tell it was just, you know, trying to get their footing. Um, when I had come into the role, it was already discussed to have this equity council. So we're trying to figure out like what this would look like, how it would work. And, you know, at one point it was like one meeting, I think the first meeting was almost just introductions of the council introducing themselves to committee members. Uh, from there, we had uh, the committee at that time said they wanted to hear from council members on issues around equity that were important to them. So uh, we had a couple presentations. One was from uh, a member who uh, was uh, talking about support for Arab and Muslim students, and she spoke from her own lived experience as a Palestinian, Palestinian American. Um, as a parent, so she gave her perspective and kind of gave this overview, uh, which seemed like it was well received. Um, there was another presentation on our member who is uh, the immigrant liaison with Baltimore County government, so she gave an overview of her work. Um, and I think those are the two that come to mind. I might be leaving out one or two. So that was the first year. And then at the end of that year, though, there was a discussion of really that the advisor becoming more um, autonomous, if you will, and they formed, you know, the, they, you know, appointed a chair, selected a chair, then they, the chair actually uh, put forth this idea of having these priorities. And that's what you all saw. Let me back up to one important step I missed. If you look at the budget cycle, the equity committee in the, the first year that the advisory existed, the equity committee 
ask the um, advisory council members to look at what the superintendent had presented for budget priorities and give comment on the items that were presented. Again, with the idea that, you know, it would give the committee members some, some, some perspectives from stakeholders. So the idea that council members would give perspective on, uh, you know, items in the budget, not, we didn't really get into policy um, a lot or that council didn't. Like that's where the idea would come from that, you know, the, the committee would have input on policy and budget that they could take back to the full board. So what you all saw uh, were, you know, I guess what the council decided were major issues uh, that they saw. And what I was trying to remind them of is, you know, again, if we look at taking this back to our equity committee, um, you know, that your purview is around budget and policy. So it eventually would have to get framed in a way that if there were some action being requested of you all, as, as board members, it would be in the context of, you know, some type of budget um, action or policy action. Um, so that's where we are today. Does, does that help? Um, yes, yeah, sort of. So at the next, so they made that presentation about a plan last time, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. yes. So what happens with that plan? Right. So a lot of the, if you look at the action parts of the plan, there's, I guess, some operational pieces that involve, you know, BTBS staff, and then some of it is more of like a community approach to trying to support schools and school leaders with, with their equity work. Um, so there's some things that would take place if, if it goes forward like it would, you all would hear about it almost with them reporting out, like letting you all know um, as as the committee, as board members, these are things that have come about because of the advisory's work. So one thing the advisory felt strongly about is, is being action oriented. So they wanted to see what they could do as a group to actually, you know, impact student outcomes, frankly. So their their idea was to take that plan you saw and put it in action and really come back to you all to number one, report out. And then number two, if they saw a need for, you know, policy change or um, additional budget, make that request to you all as well. Okay, so then when, when we have the dates on the calendar for the, the advisory council, they just are reporting out on the implementation of their plan? Correct, correct. And okay. and that, that's what's happening this school year. So as, as you all know, we only have one meeting left with them. And, you know, we can, um, I'm glad you're bringing this up too now, um, Chair Lecter. So it, we, we also need to talk about, I guess, what it's going to look like going forward. You know, the frequency of the meetings, um, you know, frankly, the outlook of the meetings, you know, again, they're going to have some leadership that may want to weigh in. Um, but I, I would say it's it's something that's being formed. It's, it's, it's evolving, if you will. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Dr. Savoy, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Chair Lichter and Vice Chair Harvey. Um, Mr. Handy, Mr. Corns, Ms. Fass, and Mr. Holmes, thank you all for joining us today. Is there any further business? Okay, the meeting is adjourned, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.